So I'm going to try to go over some uh, foundations for uh, this um, morning conversation. Where do we stand? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the United States in terms of cost and not only economic cost and benefit. How do we really want to measure progress and why we're really mature for, for a change, for a paradigm shift. So these are the facts. In the United States, about approximately um, 16.5 billion are spent every year on breast cancer diagnosis and treatment. If you add the lost productivity because of breast cancer, another 12, around $12 billion are spent and close to $3 billion now, but 2.5 was in 11. Um, billions are spent for breast cancer peer review research. So we get to an astronomic figure of 31 billion is the most expensive disease in the United States because of its frequency and because clearly we're not easy, we're not capable to prevent it and, and cure it fast. So if we want to measure progress, you know, I thought there are many ways to look at it. So maybe we want to take it away, so decrease the incidence of the disease. We want to make sure that whoever who gets it is not going to die of this disease. Um, if we're not capable to do either of the first two, we want to at least make sure we decrease toxicity and improve quality of life. And all of these attempts have to be done more and more at the reasonable economic cost and, of course, human cost. So Don Barry has modeled the progress and how fast we're going in terms of making a difference over the past 10 years. And somehow figured out that we have a 1%, I know it's tiny, but it's sizable, decrease in breast cancer mortality per year. Most probably half of it comes from screening. So there is some success from screening. It's very modest, but it's there in the appropriate group. Another half from treatment. So very small, very slowly. And not for everybody. So this is a situation in terms of race uh, for women with breast cancer that are Caucasians, as you can see the top curve. Uh, the incidence is actually more in general than, for Afri than what you, is reported for African Americans. But as you can see, African Americans are richly, slowly and gradually reaching the incidence of white women. And most importantly, while there is some progress in terms of the mortality of white women, as we said before, small but real, such a progress is not observed among African Americans. And why? Well, if you look on the right panel over there, if I have a marker, yes, over here. So in, in pink are the bars about the African Americans. They tend to have less localized disease at presentation, more regional and distant disease. But then when you look at five-year survival rates by stage, and again, compare them to all women or Caucasian women, you'll notice that across each single stage, African-American women do worse. So a problem, a serious problem. Incidence in pre of breast cancer in African-American is rapidly reaching that of white women. Stage of disease presentation tends to be more advanced, but African-American women continue to suffer higher mortality rates at each stage of the disease when compared to white and Latinas. So what is the situation worldwide? So you know, to understand a disease, it's very useful to look at the global picture of this disease. And tomorrow we're going to have a session about the global face uh, of breast cancer with Fumniolo Pari to talk about you know, what the situation in the rest of the world and what we can learn from the rest of the world. And this is a, a graph that comes from a global can, which is a, a way to um, a, an agency that really tries to describe estimate age standardized rates of disease every 100,000 women all over the world. And when you look at uh, Northern America and Israeli, Canada and United States together, and you can see that in the richer the country, the more diagnosis. But interestingly enough, you know, it, it, and you know, you can look at the, how many of the diagnosed women you're capable <clears throat> to cure by looking at a ratio of mortality or at least control the disease the ratio of mortality versus incidence. And of course, Northern America does much better than Tanzania. So in terms of the ratio of how many have the disease and how many die of it, uh, it is definitely much better, 19% in Northern America compared to Tanzania, where it's 
But is this a really um, reliable figure? Is mortality to incidence ratio a meaningful tool in breast cancer? Because if you know, look at the bar that I took the liberty to put on, it seems like the mortality across countries is actually disturbingly <coughs> similar. Is the incidence that is very different. So are we, in fact, creating some kind of a dilution in our results that you know, make, us see, make us come out like more of a success? Are we, in fact, um, increasing the early disease and the non-fatal disease with detection, early detection and screening, and in fact, somehow inflating the quality of our results? And is a concern that um, remains in the mind of many and if that is true, we should see it, we should see the increase among mostly the women who are screened, who are the women 50 and older, even if mammography is still done uh, despite the recommendation in younger women than 50. And in fact, these are the data. As you can see, uh, when you compare on the first panel, this is, oops, that's not, this is, um, you want to try not to blind my rest of the panel? Yeah, it is. Uh, I think we need another marker because it doesn't, go, it doesn't project on the way. Here it is. So here you can see <clears throat> in situ cancer growing up, right, age 50, these are the women who undergo mammography, very flat for age 0 to 49, and the incidence of invasive cancer very flat for age 0 to 49. So it's reassuring is not increasing, but certainly it changes the denominator because we are picking up more and more early non-fatal disease, most probably DCIS, through mammographic screening. So that's a problem at many levels because this artificial overdiagnosis has a cost, not only economic, and this is an interesting um, calculation and modeling done by Dr. Wallace and Schwartz a couple of years ago where they really measure what is a benefit for a 50 years old, so the woman who should be screened by mammography in the range where mammography, in fact, is effective at early detection and possibly having an impact on survival. And what results in is that the, the 10 years risk of dying of breast cancer goes down from 0.5% to 0.4%. So this is the size of the benefit. And this benefit is if this woman undergoes screening for 10 consecutive years. But what are, what are the arms? All right, so the arms is that every time you perform in such a manner and you comply with the prescription and the recommendation of your doctor, you are much more at risk of having useless biopsies and you know, in 150 um, to, to 200 times more likely. And then you have a high risk of undergoing uh, unnecessary treatment and diagnosis because in fact, you're very, um, you belong to that subset that is very unlikely to have the fatal type of breast cancer. And once again, we don't know who does and who doesn't. So we excess, there is an excess of screening to pick up the very few that could derive the benefit. And the natural history of, of invasive breast cancer detected by mammography was enlightened by this interesting experience, a collaboration between the United States and Norway, where they compare two uh, cohorts of patients. Some were in one cohort, they were screened more frequently on, on the left, and on the right were less frequently screened patients. This was, was what they expected. They thought, you know, if we do mammography less frequently, eventually at some point, the cancers that we don't detect by mammography will express themselves, will catch up. So at the end, we'll have at least the same number of cancer and possibly worse mortality in the women who were not screened. So they expected the two patterns of screening to converge at some point. But in fact, what they noticed is that the women that were less frequently screened had fewer cancers and a longer follow-up. So this is a very intriguing result because it suggests that approximately a proportion of the cancers we screened would have gone away by themselves. So of course we don't know which ones, so once we detect them, we have to act upon it but it's something that teaches us about the biology of this disease. So <clears throat> if we're not doing too well in terms of reducing incidence and reducing mortality, can we at least assure that toxicity is less and the quality of life is continuously improved? <clears throat> so there's no question we made the big progress, so I don't want to throw away you know, all the incredible you know, 
good things we have done and the, the big difference that it makes to uh, breast cancer in 2010 versus 1990 versus 170. <clears throat> For instance, all the data on breast conservation, of course, uh, have allowed many women to keep their breast. But even this is becoming, you know, like a little bit inflated as the success in breast cancer, certainly by the press. And, you know, while it's very important to keep the breast, of course, is not the most important endpoint. I also want to talk about, you know, the, the breast conservation brought about another modality, which is radiotherapy. And interestingly enough, adding radiotherapy in the management of breast cancer also has an impact on survival. I'm showing here results from a meta-analysis where the women who had positive lymph node in the armpit um, underwent, either whether they had post-mastectomy um, radiotherapy or they had post-breast conservation radiotherapy, in either case, receiving radiotherapy convey an advantage on survival which is very interesting because radiotherapy also has a toxicity, and I'm not going to talk about it today. But in general, as you can see from these curves, there was an advantage of survival. And when compared, and it's 15 years, when compared to the advantage of not giving chemo or giving an anthracycline-based regimen of chemotherapy, which, you know, in the same period of time was a very similar, very common <coughs> regimen used, you see that the size of the benefit is very, very similar. But what, what about these curves? So we are showing to my patients that we discuss it with them. Of course, there is an advantage with more treatment, but what do they really mean? Let's just look at the chemo versus no chemo curve. It means that we treat 100 women to probably benefit six or seven. So what does it mean to me? It really means to the individual patient that the odds are much more in favor to do well without treatment and do poorly despite treatment. Because once you calculate the numbers, that is what's going on. We are not capable to place each single patient into the point on the curve. So the well, individual reality is that, you know, what I, we tell patients, you have 70% likelihood to be alive in 10 years despite your breast cancer if you take the treatment, and 65% if you don't. But we know from studies that women choose chemotherapy once the 1% advantage threshold is crossed. So it's enough to tell a woman, you know, you have 1% more, and a sizable proportion of patients will choose to undergo chemotherapy. And it's understandable. It's understandable because not knowing whether you are the one who can derive the benefit or not, and because it is about your life, and for women, it's, it's not, most often it's not just about their life, it's about being around for the people they take care of. They want to do more. All women want to do more. So what I've noticed, and what I think is a, probably the most costly part of breast cancer, is that at any age or stage, a breast cancer diagnosis changes our mindset. It becomes an intrusive loss of innocence, reminding the lack of control about one's destiny. This toxicity is not measured. This is a morbidity of breast cancer that any woman, whether she has DCIS or she has metastatic breast cancer, is living with. No quality of life measures really can put the quantity and the price on this toxicity. This, of course, is much more serious for a woman with metastatic breast cancer because then it's not whether the disease will come back, it's how long do I have. And this is a nice paper that was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, was at least trying to estimate what, are the, what is the life expectancy with a woman once she's diagnosed with breast, a metastatic breast cancer? And the reason it's so important is because the disease is so heterogeneous that doctors often have difficulties even in trying to quantify. And while you, know, you can be very fatalistic and not wanting to know what, what is your life expectancy, many women ask and want to know. So they, this paper, they review all the randomized trials using you know, different treatment and so on, having enough data to really try to designed that curve, and the conclusion is that the mean value in month for each scenario is the worst value is 6.3 months, the lower typical is a year, the upper typical is three years, in best case is 55 months and so. Well, I can tell you I have patients who are alive with metastatic breast cancer 30 years later. So it's really not true that this is the range, but it just gives you the difficulties even in communicating and looking at the data once you have the disease coming back. 
So if there were anxiety about being afraid for the disease to come back, think about the anxiety once you have the disease back to know what is going to happen of your destiny. And, you know, it, the, the discouraging thing is that once you get the best in the field to conduct a very well-designed and very um, translational uh, prospective randomized trial like this one that was published in New England Journal of Medicine, the Bolero II trial, to study metastatic disease and study the most common type of metastatic disease, which is the uh, receptor-positive metastatic disease. And it was a comparison of hexamethazine and anti-hormone uh, treatment plus placebo versus the combination of hexamethazine and verulimus. It was coming from very solid preclinical work showing that, in fact, interfering with a pathway that is associated with everolimus makes a lot of sense in the mouse and, you know, some preliminary data in humans as well in, in diseases that are not breast cancer. So, and this study became a very positive study for the media, for the scientific community. It, the, the, the outcome measure was not survival, it was time to progression. And the time to progression was twice, right? Uh, then, you know, more than twice actually, then, then in the treated, in the experimental group compared to the control group. And the media picked it up and we all were talking about the study and it was considered a positive study. And the media said, this is good news from a number of angles. Both are oral medication, this I agree, that's great news. The new strategy delivers a smart bomb I agree a little bit less, but that specifically interrupts the molecular pathways involved in drug resistance. Well, it's not really true because, you know, these women eventually progress, so it doesn't really do it. The verolimus hexamestazine combination kept the cancer at bay for a median and so on for those with, with modest addition of toxicity. Well, modest for whom? <laughs> I mean, for the drug company, for FDA, for... So, so, you know, of course, and I don't want to be just destructive, you know, every single progress has a value. And, you know, the people who conducted these studies are colleagues and friends, and it was a very well done study, and, very, and all the women who participated in the study, I don't want to sound uh, negative, but the reality is that those side effects, higher in the group of the drug combination, were not so small. There was shortness of breath, hyperglycemia, mouth sores, and fatigue. I mean, these are, very sizable interference with the quality of life of the patients who got the experimental drug. And then last but not least, the cost. And I, you know, if there is no price for a human life, but this is the cost. And the idea that that cost is going to be paid somewhere by society has to stay in our mind. So if you want to summarize what in the least in my opinion is the situation is that we're not decreasing the incidence of breast cancer, certainly not of the fatal breast cancer, Decreasing mortality is, to say the least, modest. Decreasing toxicity and better quality of life, maybe, but I have a lot of question marks about that. And all of the above is certainly not at a reasonable cost. So we need a paradigm shift, and it's not that easy, and you'll hear more about uh, targeted therapy, but just I want to introduce the concept that breast cancer is a really tough disease. And as you know, it's not, we should say breast cancers because it's not one disease, so it's multiple diseases. And the attempt of the Cancer Genome Atlas Network to try to characterize breast cancer has shown, in fact, that if you look at the mutation in breast cancer, you know, only three genes that they analyzed, among all the genes they analyzed, there was at least a 10%, more than 10% incidence among, across all breast cancer studied. So even finding a very common mutation is not that simple. And then within each subset, there is enormous heterogeneity. They're very, very different. So even when we think about the four groups of the most common four groups, is extremely heterogeneous. And most importantly, this study enabled to see, uh, you know, to identify a subset where you could have a hint of the influence of the microenvironment, where the tumor is, um, and not just the tumor cells, but you know, the host and the participation of the host in the growth of the tumor to divide in subgroups. So that, you, that also plays a big role. And then, you know, the data you may have heard that at least one of the types of breast cancer is more similar to ovarian cancer than to the other breast cancers. So a lot to learn from these genetic studies, but also the disclosure of the complexity of the problem we're dealing with. And maybe the fact that we're not looking at it from the correct angle. And just want to give a, one little spotlight on another disease where maybe we're making more progress. This is data in colorectal cancer. 
And colorectal cancer, like breast cancer, progresses, goes from invading the wall of the, of the bowel to go to the lymph nodes and eventually involving other lymph nodes uh, and eventually involving other organs. So it's divided in stage one to four. And what they looked at is that presentation in these patients who had colorectal cancer, whether the microenvironment, the, the immune cells in the tumor were different from one patient to another, stage by stage. And they were able to divide, even stage one, you'll see it in red, into the subset of patients who will do great, and the subset of patients who will do very poorly, even at the very initial disease. And it go, goes across all stages, just based on the immune response of the host, the crosstalk of the host with the tumor. So we are missing a very important component in what we're studying, which is the immune system. We're not studying the immune system enough. And you know, what is going on internationally is to try to move into a classification that is using immune score. So not just how much the disease has progressed at the presentation, but how is your body responding to that presence, how is the host responding. So I'll stop at this point, and I think Sue will be next. Thank you. That was brilliant. <laughs>